Sam, thanks very much for coming on to the podcast. Yeah. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. So I think we were talking about the uh, Murakami story the other day. Is mm-hmm. that the elephant vanishes? No, it was the it was the year of spaghetti. Oh, all right. Which is like a two pager that was in the New Yorker like five years ago. Okay, I need to read that one. Uh huh. Because I read the elephant vanishes. And I, I loved it. I mean, uh huh. It was a little bit longer, so I wasn't sure which one we were talking about, but that one was that one was great. Uh huh. So I was thinking about bringing that into class, but. Mm-hmm. The Year of Spaghetti. The Year of Spaghetti, yeah, which is a story of uh, a guy in his apartment, who a, a Japanese guy in the 70s who becomes obsessed with making spaghetti. And it's sort of a figure for, like, his loneliness and I think his, like, whatever. We talk about it in class. But it's it's quite literally half of the half of the two pages are made up of him cooking spaghetti. I love and, like, that. going to the, you know, like, the exotic food store to get different Italian ingredients. Is Murakami a, a favorite writer of yours, or is this I, just kind of an example story it, that you bring in? I like it because it's really compressed, and it's very simple in its parts. There's, like, you know, like I said, there's the scenes that in his apartment. It all takes place in his apartment. Mm-hmm. One day he gets a phone call. That's it, right? So it's a really tangible plot. It's not, like, guns going off and uh you know life and death it's a very simple story of a guy in his room and so i feel like uh that mixed with its length makes it really like approachable if you're thinking about for as like for my students maybe it's your second time you've ever written a story right and it can feel so overwhelming Mm -hmm. so i like to show it to them as an example of like how little you need to work with do you usually choose like shorter stories like that to read in class or do you have any sh- stories for your course that are much longer mm-hmm. than two, three, four pages? We generally stick pretty short because again, like the whole, it's a writing class, right? It's an art class. So the point is less, uh, or I should say all of the reading is in service of writing, right? Like it should, it should really help my students write the next piece. And so there's a certain degree, you know, if I show them, you know, like there's stories that I don't show that are some of my favorites, like Sonny's Blues by James Baldwin. Mm-hmm. It's an amazing story. A little long, It's though. very long. And I, you know, that's scary to, to be told, like, you know, here's a 50-pager, now go write two pages. Yeah. Um, you know, it's harder to use stories of that length as models. So I do tend to stick shorter. But, um, I mean, one of my very favorite stories to teach, we just talked about this morning, which is a story called Guests by Mary Terrier. Um, my students always love it, um, or at least like it. And, uh, that's longer, you know, that's one that we've spent two full days talking about and reading. Um, but I do like, you know, the, the potential of slapping down like 1500 words and saying, you know, this is like basically the length of what you're writing next week. So you can really see like how much space is the author taking up to open the story or end the story. You know, I feel like it's more tangible. Now, when you are having your students write their own pieces, how do you get them started? Because I feel like that's the hardest part is thinking of an idea and mm-hmm. getting them started. And I'm, my course is great short fiction for seniors, uh-huh. and we are really focused on reading and talking and analyzing a bit more than actually creating and writing. But I do have, yeah. I do have them do some little activities with like paintings. Uh-huh. So I had. I had a painting today, but like Edward Hopper's work, I feel mm-hmm. like is a great entrance into like, what would a story look like? What would the first paragraph of this story be like just yeah. to get them thinking in that way? And so they at least have a kind of a blueprint to work with, with the image. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious about some activities or things that you do in your class to just get them going, to get yeah. them started. Yeah. Well, uh, honestly, the first, basically the first month, um, I think my class has you you're pretty encouraged to write from your life actually right so uh, i think the first thing i do is sort of like take away the pressure or i hope to take away the pressure like you got to make something up like you have to you know creative writing is imagining things that you've never done or never seen or you know so we start really small like on the first couple days of class i'll i ask my students like write down the names of 10 people who are really meaningful to you in your life, whether that's a coach, somebody from church, a parent, an uncle, your best friend. Write down important addresses, right? Like what's the street you grew up on? Um, where did you go after school every day, all of elementary school? Like, and so really setting, like, setting the groundwork for your places, your people, um, those are 
all deserving of stories, right? Mm. Um, and so maybe you change a name, right? Maybe you don't want to write a story that's outwardly about, you know, your uncle or that feels too close to home, right? And that's where you start to fictionalize. But um, for the first long while in my class, I think we're we're writing settings we know and then fictionalizing what happens there or we're writing stories that we know, but um, putting it in a new place or a different time and seeing how those like subtle changes, when you change one element of the fiction, what else does it change? Mm. Um, but then we do get into sort of like, I try to bring in, like you said about the Edward Hopper paintings, um, external stimuli, like things that trigger uh, writing. So for, for the end of class today, I played five different songs on a playlist and tried to encourage, you know, each of the writers, what does this sound like to you? Does a scene or a character or a person pop into your head? Does, uh, does a room or like a club appear? Um, so try to use like a song to just give you something that's from outside of yourself. Just kind of random songs that you selected or songs mm -hmm. that you figured they would know? No, they're, they're, I pick them for their difference in like energy. Right. Um, so there's one like there's like a really gnarly grindcore song. Um, and I expect that that's going to create a certain like feeling, right, mm -hmm. that, that maybe you're going to suddenly hear an angry narrator or picture a dirty nightclub um, versus, you know, I play like Ivy by Frank Ocean. And that uh, that song. one does feel like I think uh, my students, you all know that, you know, yeah. like everybody yeah. that's and that's a an unbelievably good song, but um, that's a different mood than the previous one. And then I play like a Jimmy Durante uh, love song from, from like the forties. Um, so trying to pick some really different sounding songs with the idea that, yeah, maybe you hear one of these things that's going to shake something loose or just make you picture a scene that's not from your life. Hmm. So you play the song and then you have them write down some associations with that song or some tr memories, mm -hmm. some triggers mm -hmm. that they can maybe write a story about. Yeah, yeah. As, as it's playing, right? As we're listening to it, you're just like writing as fast as I you like can. That. Yeah, and it actually turned into some really good stories last semester from my students where they like uh, imagined that was like a, a moment that I feel like helped uh, people imagine different people, different characters or different worlds than what we had sort of started building on. It is interesting because I do a personal essay unit in mm -hmm. my American Lit uh, junior class, and then I have this great short fiction class. And the line between the personal narrative or the memoir and the and the fiction, the short fiction, is you can't really tell sometimes. Yeah, and I think that's like I, I like that activity to mm -hmm. draw upon events and experiences in your own life and just write them down. Yeah, and then you can exaggerate. Right, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you can change anything that you need to. That's kind of the the joy of fiction or creative writing. But you also don't need to change anything, really, right? Like, and I feel like, in some ways, my creative writing classes is, is uh, creative is not a misnomer. But what you're being creative, uh, when you're being creative, is like how you handle the details, right? What you notice. Mm -hmm. um, it's no less creative to like perfectly describe this lemon colored notebook and like the burnishes on it it's real it's in my life but i still have to get it right, right right and i have to use it for the the intentions or the moods that i'm going for in my story or my poem yeah that makes sense do you um do you write much short fiction on your own or is it most is it all poetry that you that i i when i was in college i wrote a lot of short fiction i thought that i was going to be a fiction writer i mean i was obsessed with short stories um and uh now i don't write it as much i i do write prose poetry and some of that is quite i think like similar in style to some of the short fiction that i really like but i haven't written like a you know anything longer than two pages of of prose in years um, can you can you talk a little bit about your own like personal creative process and like what you need to really sit down and write? Because I know it's different for everyone, but I feel like, you know, as a writer yourself, mm -hmm. you, you've got your own systems, things that work for you. Like what's an ideal mm -hmm. situation or setting for you to really produce mm -hmm. the type of writing that you feel is your best? Yeah. 
I think in terms of, okay, so what's the best, right? Like when I feel like something's really working or a poem's really coming to me, um, for me, that is often, right, like moments from my life um, that have been in some way like crystallized over some time. Um, so I do, you know, I, a lot of my poems and, and a lot of what I write about is partially at least, right, stolen from my life. Um, but I almost never, like, write a poem the day that something's happened or the day after something's happened to me. Um, usually there's, like, a pretty long gestation period where it's, like, a year has passed, and then all of a sudden these poems can sort of come out. And often, for whatever reason, it, it does happen like that. Like, um, I mean, I can just give you, like, one example. Like, the newest poem that I, that I wrote... Um, I wrote like, or I wrote the first draft of it like two weeks ago, and uh, it's really using as its like plot the, this experience of my my house, my basement flooding last summer. Um, moved into a new house, and and it was like, just it was getting nailed. It was just overflowing with water in the basement all summer long. So and people like, you know, I've talked about that. If you see me in the hallway or when you met me in August or September that was something that was happening to me. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly like in June, you know, and it, the first of those poems like just kind of started showing up. And so even though that was like, I mean, it was quite literally, it dominated my entire summer. It was like, it was my life then, but I never wrote anything about it. And now I feel like I'm about to work on starting a, a whole series of poems that have that as part of the concern. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting how it takes a little bit of time before you start to realize that this is a poetic type of experience for mm -hmm. you. I feel like, I don't know, in my own writing, in my own poetry that I try to write, um, I feel like I know when I'm in a situation or a moment that mm -hmm. could, could kind of work for a poem. And it's, I think in terms of writing that poem, it takes a little bit of time to actually sit down and like recall those events. But mm -hmm. I feel like there's a certain situation that I'm actually living in that uh -huh. I know this could kind of work well or, or fit mm -hmm. on the page. Yeah. For whatever reason, that just like almost never happens. It's, it's, it's exactly opposite, which yeah. I think I've always thought is so weird. And I think partially like even when I think back to being a teenager, uh, like a high schooler and what moved me to write, uh, maybe like a prerequisite for my needing to to write or feeling like expressive is like some bit of nostalgia or like some bit of recreating the past um even if that is a negative past or even if that's only five months ago like i don't know something happens where the the moments are they're like ready uh, they're, they're ready to write about yeah you're reminding me of the poem we read cows at night hayden caruth uh -huh. today uh -huh. in class it's a great poem but yeah but i don't know if it works that well for i didn't, it didn't work that well for my high school class because uh -huh. it, you do need like a little bit of like life experience i think to have those recollections that nostalgia mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. comes back to you i don't mm -hmm. know but you can always be nostalgic for what's happening right now right i feel like that was my constant experience of being like an 18 year old was just almost feeling grief for that night's not going to happen again. Like that Friday night, like I wish this would last yeah. forever or, and knowing, right. I mean, part of what's so intense about being a high schooler is that there are all of these finish lines, right? Like, and so I feel like I was constantly like, how can I trap this in Amber? Like where, you know, what's going to happen to my friends? What's going to happen to us? This feels good. I don't want it to end. Yeah. Um, and so that like, you can almost be nostalgic for something bef before or as it's happening. And I think that's maybe part of what yeah, got me started putting stuff on paper. Yeah, the high school seniors, I was like, I was telling them, you guys are leaving, you're going to college. Like, aren't you walking around your school at this point, second semester and saying, oh, I wish I was, you know, running around on the turf mm -hmm. with, the little, with the little kids again or in the middle school. Like you still, like, I think mm -hmm. it's a perfect time to have those feelings of, mm -hmm. I wish I just had a little bit more time here at, at yeah. my school. Mm -hmm. um, when you were in high school, so you studied English in college. When you were in high mm -hmm. school, did you know that you were really into this subject of English and writing and poetry? Yeah, I think about that all the time. And I've been trying to figure that out since, particularly since starting here at Gilman. Um, like trying to locate when and why and what happened to sort of get me into writing. 
I don't know. You know, like I remember I, I was really, I was like an art room kid. You know, I was, I was always in uh, my two art teachers' classrooms, iPod in, like, and for the start of high school, I like, I thought I was going to be a painter. You know, that's what I, or a graphic designer maybe, but I loved making visual art. And I don't have such a specific memory of turning towards writing. Like, I know that my senior year I applied and won this, like state scholarship in English. And I know that uh, when I was 17, I read This Side of Paradise, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's first book. And that made an impression on me, but I can't remember, you know, I don't remember if that was like, now I want to be a writer Mm -hmm. or if it was more gradual than that. Um, But I always uh, loved writing. I also wrote a lot about music. Like I thought that I maybe for our for my high school paper, I was the music critic, you know. And I thought that maybe that would be a way that I was a writer was like writing about. So you loved, other always art. loved art. Yeah, yeah, okay. big time. Once I realized I wasn't going to be like an NBA player um, <laughs> or or a pro snowboarder, then that was like the next thing. Yeah, uh-huh. I was going to ask you about. I was going to ask you if you were a pain or, or not mm-hmm. because I had just read that Monet poem that you wrote mm-hmm. and I mean it seemed very much like you had experience painting before because you captured that I guess that feeling very well thanks in the poem yeah yeah I mean I mean I rarely painted with oils but yeah I did I did a lot of painting um and a ton of drawing my whole life my whole childhood um so I, I, I'm a total dilettante, but I'm like vaguely, I'm still super into art and art history. And uh, one of my first uh, like summer jobs in college, I worked at an art gallery in, in New York. So it's, you know, I, I went to Barnes Foundation in Philly last weekend. Like yeah. I'm, it's still one of my obsessions, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I gonna ask you? How did the Monet poem like come to mind for you? How'd mm-hmm. you get that idea? So that is the rare exception. That's a moment where I, I wrote that poem at the museum as I was seeing this video. So uh, the poem is a poem, just to give a little background, uh, it's called On the Footage of Monet Painting. And there's some footage from 1915 from this uh, documentary. It's like a survey of French art um, made by the filmmaker Sacha Guitry. And so there's like sections of famous French artists and there's like 15 minutes of Monet painting in his garden at Giverny. And that footage was playing in a show at the Met Museum um, a few summers ago. And and so it was just like a rolling loop of this film footage. I think I saw that. You may have seen it. Yeah. It was like, it was a show about the invention of parks and public space. And that as a particularly like a French innovation. Anyway, there's this footage, it's very like juddery. It's, it's projected or the the sinking doesn't quite link up with the playback speed uh, across technology, so he's painting kind of quickly. But you watch him actually working on his paintings in the garden, and I watched that. I watched through the loop, and then I sat down on a bench and I just wrote. Um, and of course, that so that's like the first draft, and then I edited. I wrote it. It was much much longer when I first wrote it. Kind of just kept the good stuff. Tried to hone it, and find like a theme or what is it what am I writing about um or what are these couplets because it's set in lines of two um where's like the through line here and so that then edited it but I literally you know I can remember just sitting in that atrium in the back of the Met writing that poem so that did happen just like right then but I feel like that's because it wasn't an experience from my life it's it's an ekphrastic it's a it's a poem about an artwork Mm. And so it was that didn't need some gestation for me to dive right into the artwork. Yeah, I feel like I maybe have seen that or I've seen some Monet because it, it, the video looks like one of those flip books, I feel like, right? Where you're yeah. flipping through and it's moving through time. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's not perfectly stable, right? The way that movement is happening in it. You can find it on YouTube. You yeah. know, if you, if you just, if you YouTube like Monet um, painting, 1915, or it's called Seu de Chenu is the name of the documentary. And again, the director's Sasha Guitry. So you can Google any of that and find it. So you write that poem down in your notebook. It's a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. What's what's the typical process for you after you write something in your notebook? How do you mm-hmm. make sense of it, make it into a poem, edit it, mm-hmm. and just find the right, I guess, form for the final product? Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it happens in stages. And I feel like I... 
put it in a notebook first often or second and it'll be um I don't I try not to decide before before it becomes necessary or inherent like what the shape or the form of the poem is going to be right so try to write long lines and see what that looks like uh what if I cut those lines in half you know what is it how do these words feel different if there's four of them on a line or 14 of them on a line um so I'll do that word when I actually type it up into my computer that becomes like a sort of first pass it's like does any of this stink like, does that line just get deleted? Maybe it doesn't make it onto my laptop. Um, but that's also right. Then when I'm going from pen and paper, where the point is just get everything down, um, with the word processor, like Word or Pages or Google Docs, however you, you were writing, um, then it, you can. it's very easy to cut a line in half, right? Or it's very easy to say, like, what would this look like in couplets or stanzas of four lines, quatrains, versus what if this is all a single block stanza, or what if this is prose? Mm -hmm. um, so playing with that happens, and that happens as I'm editing, because you'll s often, right, you can put more pressure on a line. If you break them in half and they're like four line, four word lines, anything bad is going to feel excessive, right? You're, it becomes very easy to be like, that's not a line, right? That doesn't, that language is fluff, or it's, it's not working, it's not doing enough work. And so then that helps you cut stuff out. Um, your phrases that aren't as good or don't sound as good, you can get rid of some of those. Maybe then you realize, oh, but it does actually want to be like, it makes sense for it to be couplets and the lines should be longer. So then I'll chunk those like three words back onto the end. And that's the fun part, right? Is when you sit down at the word processor and you're, it's, oh, it's almost like painting, you're creating art and you're mm -hmm. just toying around with the structure and what sounds good, what should be cut out, how mm -hmm. should I structure this on the page? Yeah. That feels that does feel fun. It feels like if if I'm at a point in a poem where the for a second at least I can stop worrying about like the ideas and just worry about intensifying the effects, right? Like so okay, I got it. Now I got to get it better. Um what's the next step? How can I maybe I'll run through the poem just thinking about sound, right? And like what are some synonyms or you know how can i make the sound and the rhythm the sonic effects sound better spend an hour on that mm -hmm. um and then you go back through and also i think i talked about this in my assembly a little bit but i do think there's an importance in again like uh taking some time away from it right so maybe if i write a poem in my notebook it might be four months before i bring it back out and type it up try to get it into something that looks more like the poem i want it to look like um find a form for it. And then that all leads to maybe like sending it to a friend or, you know, to another poet or just getting it ready and feeling like it's ready to go out to magazines and see what they think. Right. Um, but that's, I guess that's sort of how, it, the, how it works. So no, so after you've written it, knowing whether it's good or not, is such a difficult question. It's all, mm -hmm. it's, it's very subjective, very personal, mm -hmm. I guess. I guess you can get other feedback on it, which helps, yeah. but yeah, it's it's just strange to think that there's like a point in time, there's a moment when you're like, I'm I'm good with this. I think mm -hmm. this is my best that I can do. I, can, uh -huh. I couldn't arrange things any better. Mm -hmm. You're just giving up. I think honestly, like it's like I've done. You're I'm out of energy. Of it. Yeah, it's like it's like the end of a 400 meter dash. You're like, okay, I'm done, <laughs> right? Um, and you can go back to it, right? Maybe. And so that's then it's just like you send it to your friend and. You send it to another poet and she thinks, okay, yeah, this is good. You know, like it, that's the best case scenario. Um, this is good. This line wasn't as good. Maybe that's not your true ending yet. And then you're like, oh, screw it. I don't yeah. even want to look at it. And then you wait two months and then you, uh, the best thing that happens I find is that if I lose some of that attachment to it, like if I stop feeling like, oh, this is my best poem ever and getting like emotional ab about when someone tells me it sucks, mm -hmm. uh, then you might find more to add, right? Like it's it's fun to augment it. You can see it for what it is and you're like, okay, what if, if I said two more lines in this poem, like what could I do that would be pretty cheap, like pretty easy to just to add right now um, that would really make the whole thing like deeper, richer. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I coached squash this winter mm -hmm. with, uh, Chris Childers mm -hmm. and we were talking a little bit about the writing process and some poems that we like and mm -hmm. I think he told me I'm not sure if this is true or not but he told me something about a Philip Larkin poem that 
he like waited years and ye- like 10 years or something to find the last line for the poem. Mm-hmm. Like that much time had to go by as he was yeah. like actively living his life and kind of had the, I'm sure you kind of walk around with like the filter looking for different mm-hmm. things that might work in your poetry for 10 years. I mean, to mm-hmm. think that it could take that long to find the words that you're looking for. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And it, it is, it's just, you know, at a certain point, I think, I need or I'm I'm ready for the poem to be I don't know it's just like it's to be not mine you know uh, and so, so I think I I've said this before but yeah best case then like you know somebody really likes it or someone publishes it and that feels like okay you know this group of 20 editors did did find it to be sufficiently finished um but if that doesn't happen yeah i'll just i'll keep it around you know and i've got poems that i'm still working on and and some of the poems that i have published it was like seven years after i wrote it do you ever look back at your old poetry poetry you've written years ago and just say ah like i've learned so much since then and i I really feel like i wrote this poem or Mm -hmm. this poem's no good to me now yeah i do i do um but most of that bad stuff like or if I'm, if I feel as though if it's like uh, going to be an eye roll, like it doesn't make its way back to me, you know. Like I've either tucked it away in some it's out there. trash bin on my computer, like you know, it's it's not the stuff that is worth saving. I try at least to like sort of remember and haul along with me. Um, the best thing is when I look back at old stuff I write, and I'm like, I don't even remember writing this, but it's good. Yeah. Right, like that, and that has happened, is like, that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, when you feel like, whoa, I wrote this when I was in college, and I don't hate it. That's a shock, totally, and that feels awesome. So you you majored in English, but you took mm-hmm. a lot of creative writing courses, I assume, in college? Yeah, or? Yep. yeah, I mean, I took, uh, I studied uh, with, some of my first classes at, at Pomona were with the fiction writer Charmaine Craig, and... Um, even her like literature classes um, always had us doing writing exercises. And so, uh, yeah, and I took fiction workshops and poetry workshops all throughout college. Um, my school didn't split like English w- being literature, or, you know, reading and criticism from like the creative writing classes. It was all happening in the same building with the same profs. So, mm. um, but yeah, I did. I took a lot of short fiction, short fiction workshops. And then a few poetry surveys and and poetry workshops. Yeah. When you graduated, did you get right into writing or did you do something else for a bit and then mm-hmm. come back to it? Or how did you kind of make your way into the, the realm of poetry long yeah. term, I guess? Yeah, it was a long time, actually, between, between when I graduated from college and when I started my master's in poetry, um, my, mas- my MFA. That was... That was five years, you know, and I first, uh, I worked in an art gallery. I did then when I, uh, the fall after I graduated, I started working at a publisher at at Grove Atlantic. And so working in literary publishing, um, which felt like a very easy transition from studying English to, you know, working in the publishing world. But then I only did that for like six months before I then moved and worked, uh, worked at the Criterion Collection, which is a film company, a mm. film, you know, they publish like, it's like Penguin Classics, but for movies. Got it. Um, and I, that was what I did for the majority of my time um, before, for like four years before then moving down here, which uh, I, we moved to Baltimore because I started grad school at Hopkins. Um, so yeah, it took a long time and I was doing other things. Um, it was all vaguely like, writing related, you know, even at Criterion, I was writing stuff for the website. I was writing film synopses and film history stuff for metadata. I was, uh, for, for a while running all the social media, right? So, you know, writing those little tiny poem, like tweets, Facebook posts, captions. I was always doing stuff with words, but, um, yeah, it was, it was a while. It took me a while to say, I want to really commit to this. Like i And I'm really glad for that because then when I came back to school, you know, grad school was like heaven. It was like, I'm walking across, I'm on a campus again. Yeah. And I'm meant to spend my whole life reading deeply and writing. Um, That was just like such a treat. And it felt like a treat for me. And I think maybe if I were 
22 and had just come out of four years of doing homework, it would still just kind of feel like homework. Yeah. Um, but I think that that time off allowed me to really see it for the opportunity that it was. So when you went to Hopkins, uh, like I'd love to hear just a little bit about that program and Mm -hmm. what it was like moving to Baltimore and kind of getting started in this, Mm -hmm. I guess, new experience that you decided on after a few years. Yeah. I mean, it was was super overwhelming and intense to be back in school. Um, The program is really small, right? So, and, and a lot of, of MFA masters of fine arts writing programs are, um, but so it's, there were four other poets or three other, that's a cohort of four, right? Oh, so like really? every that's year, small. four of you. Wow. Um, and so, and then there were four uh, fiction writers that were in my same year, but we didn't, so you have, you're just in poetry classes. You have one or two readings courses and then one workshop every week. So you're spending like a three hour class period and that might be in the modernist poem um, or you know a survey of English poetry. Um, you know, there you have these sort of focuses like the classes here. And then you have like one just workshop generating. But even for the reading classes, you're generating a lot of work. So you're writing just all the time, basically, just all the time. What did it, what did it take to get into something so for poets? I mean, so mm-hmm. competitive. How do you apply? How do you get into a program like that? Yeah. Um, and it was all pretty mystifying to me. I mean, I had a, I had one friend who was older than me and who was like a uh, basically like childhood heroes, uh, Nick and Aaron Potter, shout out to you too. Um, but they were a few years older than me and I started hanging out with them in Centerville in my town growing up. Um, but, uh, at some point Nick got into an MFA, a fully funded MFA as they're called, right? Meaning that you don't have to pay, right? Um, if you get in and, uh, so he got into one and I was like the first time I'd ever heard of this thing. Um, was what you can go to grad school and in exchange for your teaching effectively you get paid right because you teach at the university after a certain point right um and i didn't know you could do that you know and so yeah then you then it's a a crapshoot and you take basically a writing sample of 10 pages and one or two essays it's kind of like redoing the college process but so i had like 10 pages of poems and two maybe one page essays and then rec letters and you submit to these uh, MFA programs. And if you're very, very, very lucky, I got waitlisted and yep. then I got in. Um, so that's how I landed at Hopkins. So it's not a crazy amount of, I mean, 10 poems is substantial, but mm-hmm. it's not, it's not out of control. I mean, 10 no, poems, right. and two you essays. don't have to have, you don't have to walk in with like a, you know, yeah. a book ready to go. Yeah. Um, you have to show, Right, as much depth as you can in those ten pages, which is pretty galling, right? Um, and I think looking back at my MFA app, I'm I feel lucky. You know, I'm like, wow, okay. You know, I was a, a kid as far as being a poet. You know, I had so much to learn. Um, but so yeah, you put your ten best pages forward, cross your fingers, yeah, and you know, apply to a number of schools. Hmm. Um, I'm curious a little bit about you growing up in Center View, Centerville, Utah, mm-hmm. and then you went to Pomona College in California, right? Is that Southern? Yep. Southern? Yeah, it's outside. It's in L.A. County. It's like it's like 40 minutes east of downtown L.A. Oh, okay. Um, mm-hmm. What I only know about Pomona is that they got the best dining hall, best food, right? <laughs> is that true? Uh, I can't speak to that. I don't know. I mean, I feel like it, it's been ten that. years. You know. Um, <laughs> oh no, best dorms. It's best. The dorm. dorms were good. Yeah, they were fine. The dorms were good. The dining halls were good enough. And one thing that's actually amazing about Pomona is it's part of a consortium of five schools. So there are five colleges that are all next to each other. There's Pomona, Scripps, Harvey Mudd, Claremont McKenna, um, and Pitzer. So there are these five undergrad institutions that are all like, it's like the tri-schools. Yeah. You know, it's across the street. But you can go to any of those dining halls for any meal. Oh, okay. And so, you know, it's like, nice. oh, it's smoothie night at, or it's like smoothie brunch at CMC. It's omelet morning at, uh, you know, at Scripps or whatever. Um, and so the, the variety in terms of what you're looking at dining wise. Was, nice college town where you can kind of meet all of these other yeah. students. I mean, yeah. you definitely feel, cause the schools are really small, you know, yeah. um, but you feel like you aren't 
only looking at those like 400 people again and again and again because yeah, yeah you start to make friends at the other campuses um and that all that that's cool it's an advantage and you can also cross and roll so like my most my most uh life-changing like film classes were all at cmc at claremont mckenna um so that was cool too so yeah. growing up in utah going to school in california and then relocating to baltimore mm -hmm. um that's a pretty substantial move change mm -hmm. of scenery yeah um, i looked up centerville it's like mm -hmm. right in salt lake yeah or yeah a it's, bit it's around the corner from downtown it's like literally you know there's a there's a mountain and you you drive around the the edge of the mountain and there are a couple towns where one of them haven't been to salt lake um, yet but it's on the it rocks i like it yeah um but yeah so i've, I've lived uh in the west then in southern california then in new york and now in baltimore um i like them all like them all different like it's very all. different yeah and i do think um i don't know baltimore is a, a pretty awesome place to be an artist i think i think it's one of the places that you can that because of the schools and because of the the art scene here but also because you can afford to live here as an artist is a, a draw for a lot of people right there's i think there's a reason that baltimore kind of punches above its weight there are a lot of bands that come out of here right a lot of rappers a lot of um you know there are, there are filmmakers writers who are all located here and for the a city of our size that's you know it's pretty cool very true um, what's Centerville, Utah like, and what was it like growing up mm -hmm. there for you? Um, so Centerville is a small, I mean, if I say a small town, that kind of gives you a good idea. It's become more globalized like any American small town in that, you know, now it's like, it's quite different actually than when I was growing up too. Um, I think it was a lot more rural and there were, you know, I remember like, it was an enormous political rift when Walmart was coming in, right? Like zoning battles and things like that. But now you can get any any chain restaurant on earth is like on Parish Lane um, in Centerville. But it was a really small town, right? There was just, there's our one high school, one junior high. Um, and it's nestled right on the foothill of the, of the Wasatch Mountains, right? So my house, you like, you know, when we take our dog for a walk, we like go up on the mountain. Oh, um, and... And so it's it's really cool geographically. It's kind of sandwiched between the Wasatch Mountains, which is like a, a foothill range of the Rockies, and the Great Salt Lake, right? So there's this little corridor called the Wasatch Front. That So you're looking out at Antelope Island on the lake. Uh, the sun sets out there and rises up above the mountains in the morning. So it's a really amazing, um, like, landscape to grow up in. And Centerville is sort of like... On the west side, it's still rural. There's, you know, like ranching and people have horses and cows and, uh, you know, feed stores and, and a lot of factories, too, and refineries out on the, toward the lake. And then, like, very residential and suburban uh, as you get into town a little bit more. And that was, like, a, a really cool mix. You know, I felt like nature, nature mattered and landscape was an important part of my childhood, but so was, like, you know, going to... Wendy's yeah. um, and hanging out in parking lots and driving mattered for that landscape. It's a very um, homogenous place, right? And I grew up like deeply in in the heart of Mormonism, right? Like, and that is a major factor in my upbringing and the culture of the place. Um, my high school, the culture of the high school, the culture of my education, um, all of that was inextricably linked to like the Mormon church and to um, yeah, that's the, that's the high majority culture there. Um, and so that, that creates kind of a pressure cooker environment for some folks. Uh, but I don't know, I can say more, but you it's also what the poems are about. You've got to miss some of the outdoor element. If you are walking your dog and you're oh, going yeah. on a little hike, I mean, mm -hmm. Baltimore has some, some good stuff around here, but nothing mm -hmm. like the, the, the West. No. No, <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. There's nothing. I mean, yeah, it, you know, some of my students are like skiing at Wisp on the weekends, going around top. And um, You're like, that's in my back. That's my backyard back home. A little bit. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I mean, I do. I, I love going to Lake Roland. I like the parks here. Um, but it's not the kind of biodiversity or like awe inspiring landscape, you know. Um, yeah. So you, you draw a a lot upon your 
experiences in childhood in mm-hmm. your poems you would say i mean mm-hmm. I, I was reading the butcher poem which is one of my favorites of mm-hmm. yours and that's your grandfather right in the butchery and yeah yeah so that's a poem um that poem came from a text message that my grandpa sent me so my grandpa um he's retired and he lives in a, a much smaller small town called wellsville like up on the utah idaho border um outside of outside of Logan, Utah, where Utah State is. Anyway, my grandpa, who grew up on a farm in, in southern Idaho and kind of grew up around animals his whole life, um, now as like a hobby, he raises a couple steers every year in his backyard, <laughs> uh, like two cows, two small-sized cows, Dexter, um, in his backyard and raises them for the year and feeds them and their, their beef stock, right? Like So then at the end of the season, He'll have the cows butchered and processed and gives that food, that meat to like all his kids and his kids' kids. So we always like, anytime I come back from Utah, it's with a, I bring like a cooler and bring some frozen steak and chuck roast and stuff and have, you know, all this like home, you know, quite literally homegrown beef. Um, But he sent me a picture of the processing of the scene of the butchery taking place in a text and I wrote this poem about that scene because it felt so like it's just it's in it's literally in his driveway right and so it felt so emblematic of that place right Mm -hmm. like that can't happen everywhere right you don't see that some places and some places you do and you don't even blink right and so I wrote that poem kind of like an ekphrastic it was kind of like reading into that image and then like fictionalizing or making up things that I thought would add uh just like make it a better poem yeah. Well, would you mind reading that one, or do yeah. you want to read another one? Yeah, I'll read that. Let me. I can pull it up. Yeah. Um. Because that's that's one of my that's the first one I heard. I think at the uh, assembly. Uh huh. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, it's very short too. So that's that works. All right, let me find it. Then we've got to do the factory accident because I love that. <laughs> you got it. Okay, so this is butchery. They do it right here in the front yard in Wellsville. The Dexter in her green tarp shroud, the other carcass already beef-treed and headless. A boy and girl bike passed and barely seemed to see it dripping out onto its own heavy hide. The man yanks aside, looking unbelievably like no one so much as a matador swinging his flannel muleta wide. It's the best. Love that. So, yeah, I mean, that was, that, that's kind of in the image, you know, in the picture, you've got one cow or, you know, one steer that's on the ground and the other, like, you know, he's pulling the cowhide off from the scene and it's this action that's so reminiscent of a matador, like pulling his, yeah. you know, pulling his, his muleta, the, the sort of like target uh, cloth. It was just like, I, there, that's all I need, you know. Like that's ridiculous. That's it's too crazy that it looks like that. Yeah. So. And I I think uh, one thing that in your poems that I really like is the just the rhymes within the poem that mm-hmm. aren't necessarily at the end of each line, but mm-hmm. you know, wide, high, just kind of yeah, like mashed up in there in those last two lines. Yeah. Just it it it's like pleasant in in you know to end the poem. It mm-hmm. just reads well yeah I, I that's so that's one thing you do in the like the revision process or as you're working into a poem right is you want to heighten or intensify those effects right and rhyme also links meanings right like when we hear a you know if you think of uh you know it, if you say red and dead in a poem um those words become associated and they ring together in your mind afterward, right? And so rhyme is like a really good way. It almost makes something like a law. You can almost fake it, right? Like it convinces us like precognitively. Mm -hmm. A rhyme feels right before it actually like is right. Um, And so one way that you can use rhyme is to like, and so, so here, yeah, like hide and wide is like he's still holding the hide out, right? Like at the end of the poem, it's, it's being swept aside. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, a, that's an easy sort of link there. Um, but yeah, you want to use all the tools available to you to like heighten the language in, in those ways, whether that's rhyme or um, other sonic stuff. And you said the text message. Did you explain the text message yet? The, 
about where the inspiration for this poem comes well, from? Well, yeah, so that was, he texted me a picture of this. Oh, right? that, that so was it. he texted it. you, yep, and I was like, <laughs> okay, here we go. That's that's that. That's, that's a poem. poem. You know, he texted. And I think that took me, I didn't write it the day he sent it to me, but that was basically, that was it. And I was also at the time reading um, this Irish poet, Michael Longley, who has this great book um, called Gorse Fires that has all of these wonderful, like, really short poems, like four line poems. And so I was really interested in like a long line and a poem that is quite contained and feels really honed. Like that's the moment done. Um, and so this felt like something I could encapsulate in that form that I was already interested in. Yeah, I think that's maybe important to talk a little bit about for just the students who might be interested in writing, mm -hmm. who might be listening to this how important reading is or how influential reading can be to your own creative work mm -hmm. um, and maybe how like some of the poets that you read on your own or are interested in or your favorite poets have mm -hmm. influenced you. Yeah. I mean, like this is going to sound like a really teachery answer, but there's simply, there's no replacement. Like if you want to be a writer, read full stop, right? You can't like, Oh, I want to make, I want to set out on my own, territory or like I don't need examples to get where I'm going it's just it's just ignorant yeah you have to you read everything and everything becomes part of who you are or you reject it right and then you actually have something to be uh fighting against or reacting to but um there's no there's simply there's no replacement and it's the the thing you must do as a writer is you you just read all the time and it also becomes easy and fun when you, you know, you read a poem and you think, oh, I want to do that. Like there's, there's a separate, there's a joy in understanding or feeling like you can meet a writer on their level. You're like, I know what she's doing here. I can, so that's cool. I'm on her level. And then maybe like, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. I want to write something like that. Or I want my story to end that way. Um, and so that becomes like, a model for you too, right? So that you're not just like, you know, walking blindly uh, toward some poem that might exist. But um, yeah, it's it's the way that you learn what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Th that is the education. Do, do you ever feel like you read too much of a certain poet or you, you try to read too much that it actually corrupts your own voice in some ways? Mm -hmm. Like it's too much education, too mm -hmm. much coming in. I need to like find my own expression without the, I guess, influence of these other writers. Yeah, I think that that can happen, um, definitely, right? But but that's good. That's growth, right? And there you, re you know, to use like a baseball term, right? There's a regression toward the mean eventually, right? Like uh, you won't sound like Gwendolyn Brooks forever. Uh, you might ha you might write two poems that are really really Gwendolyn Brooksy, and then uh, what isn't yours falls away, right? Yeah. And you don't you you shouldn't ever regret writing that one poem that was that sounded too much like Michael Longley or whoever, right? Like um, because you you keep their tools, right? Mm -hmm. So the things you learn that they do, and really you only get that through kind of reading too much of someone or engagement, right? If you look at a an anthology or poems you love, you might get a couple moves that you can do or something you can do once. But if you read a, like 50 poems by a poet, then that can really become part of your toolkit, right? Or like that's a move that you can now hmm. do. But you, you know, you, you can't help but sound like yourself, right? Eventually, Jake will come back, you yeah. know? Like, so yeah. it, it, I don't think that there's any fear in oversaturating. In fact, I think that's like, that's the tutelage, right? For a while, I sound like Robert Lowell, and for a while, I sound like Lucille Clifton. For a while, I sound like somebody else, and then these things just keep happening, and then eventually, you you sound like you. Hmm. I like that. That's good advice. Do you ever do, uh, I guess, mimicry assignments or assignments in your creative writing class where the students are trying to mimic a certain mm -hmm. writer yeah, and sound we, like them? Yeah, we call those imitations, right? Like, um, And I haven't done that. I didn't do that last semester, but I probably will this semester, and I've done it in the past, especially with poetry, right? Is like, I think sometimes when you're, especially when you're starting out writing poetry, you like are this full person who has a full life and things that you really care about and the things that make you you, and then you open your notebook and you start to write and you like, this poetry voice comes out. It's like, I can only talk about certain things and I can only say it in a certain way. Um, 
And so imitation is a good way to like break out of that. Um, if you want to get, if you want to practice using a different set of language, right. Or like maybe a different register, right. So like this, you know, Derek Walcott, like we're referencing Greek myth and we're using really like highfalutin language and like beautiful melodic language. So one poem writing that way can reveal some tools or something that you might do in your next poem, even when you're just writing as yourself. But you might say, oh, I, I never thought about like using a slant rhyme or rhyming consonants in that way, or now I'll go do that. Mm -hmm. But I won't sound like I'm copying Derek Walcott next time I do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think it's a good, it's it's a really instructive, right? Because you're just, you're always trying to copy someone, but that is a more sort of specific way that you're trying to integrate somebody's mm -hmm. tools and thinking ex explicitly about that, right? Like, what is he doing in this poem? I'm going to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's and that's good. the only way you can recognize sometimes how writing even happens, right? Like, because when I'm talking or something, right, which we equate with writing speech, uh, I'm not always thinking about those decisions as I talk. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good exercise. Um, it's probably something that you, you know, even as a professional poet, you even do on your own more explicitly. Like, what is this poet actually doing? Like, write that down, make a note of that, and then try to replicate it. I feel mm -hmm. like it's... No matter who you are, if you're just a beginner poet or master at it, you're mm -hmm. you're constantly doing that. Yeah, you're always. I mean, if if you're lucky, you're inspired by stuff all the time. Yeah, and you're seeing things that work or seeing things you hadn't thought of, and then wanting to try it. Right, like it's fun. It's 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 like a, a handshake or a passing of a baton or something. It's like it's the way that we influence each other as artists. Um, can we do the Incident, the, the factory accident, factory accident, one of my favorites. Sure. Where did this story come from, or this poem? Yeah. So this poem, uh, is, oh, this one's actually quite old and let me find it. But I think when I was writing this poem, so for a while, my dad worked at a cheese plant, uh, when he was uh, in his twenties. Um, and, uh, I think I, I kind of wanted to write a poem like that. Uh, I, I wanted another scenic poem that felt like it was in some way typifying or symbolizing um, a place from my childhood. But then I also explicitly wanted to write like kind of like a labor poem and a poem that was, um, you know, talking about the, the dangers of work and the way that that workplaces and, and big businesses have kind of left behind uh vulnerable uh, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, and again, I can't even remember at this point, I wrote this one quite a while ago, but um, that was the sort of like, that was what was in the water. And then I also, to bring it to my creative writing students, like I was also thinking about these poems that ended in a kind of escalating cliffhanger um, and wanting to Oh, also I broke my arm. I forgot that that's, that's also what this experience is about is breaking through all the bones in my right arm, wow. which was a snowboarding accident. Oh but God. so I'm transmuting it here into this scene um, that is not snowboarding, but this experience of like, of, of yeah, shattering my, my bones. And, and so the physical descriptions here and the actual response that you'll hear at the end of the poem, that was my buddy, it's right? That was my buddy when I was, when this event took place. Oh my God. So um, it's real. It's autobiographical to go back to your bit. Yeah. In, in some ways, right? Off. I mean, it's, it's not autobiographical in that it's not taking place in a factory in my life. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's taking place at a factory in a place that I grew up maybe, but, um, I'll just let it, I'll just read it now. So a factory accident. It was two things. When I went to pull my goggles off at the edge of my sight, I thought I saw my wrist unhook and spin free of its forearm, but it was numb. Down at the medic station, I teased up my sleeve half inch by half inch, only didn't look. Just kept my eyes on your face. Oh, you said, oh shit, and drew a breath. I love how the poem starts, it was two things. And then obviously the ending, oh shit, and true of breath. Um, how do you, and this might be a difficult question, but mm. you probably get this a lot in your class. 
how do you know how to start a poem? Because that, mm-hmm. like that beginning of that poem, it was two things, colon, and then, mm-hmm. and then ending a poem. Like, how, how yeah. do you know how to do that? How do you? Mm-hmm. You cop it nat- from other writers. No, it's not natural. It's not your inherent storytelling ability. You look at, you read, you watch the tape, you know? You're like, so <laughs> so how does this writer open their story? Like today I handed out a printout to my classes of every opening sentence of every story we've read so far this semester, right? And so you can see a different different ways of opening a piece and grabbing a reader's attention. Um, some of them are extremely plain, right? Where it's like, um, you know, so the story guests that I referenced at the start of this interview, um, it was two months after my mother died that my father started bringing home guests or something like that, right? It's very, it's just, this is the facts, right? Year of Spaghetti by Murakami. 1971 was the year of spaghetti. So it's just, it's not trying to confuse you or mystify you. It's just very plain. It's saying this is what, here we go, intro, right? Um, and here, right, this is like a monologue, right? This is a spoken poem, right? The, the narrator is, is kind of talking. And so it's like storytelling. It was two things. Uh, this first thing that worried me, and then the second thing that really worried me. And... I wanted, I like, uh, so an ending of a poem that I think is cool is where there's the, like, the sound in the room after the poem. You know, it's like it's like a scene in a movie where the dialogue happens and then the director holds for an extra beat, mm-hmm. right? And it's like you, you, in this case, you hear the people shuffling in the hallways and there's this, like, really unneutral, intense like quiet space or white noise or whatever. And so I wanted that to end the poem, right? That this like intake of breath um, where things are literally kind of hanging in the air. And so uh, that sort of escalation up to that moment, that's a type of ending, right? And there are other poems that end that way. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm, and so reading poems that ended that way showed me, oh, that's one way to end a poem or, or, you know, looking at, movie scenes and thinking there's different ways to end a scene or cut away from a scene, right? It doesn't have to just be after the last actor has said his last word, you know, you could hold for 15 more seconds or 15 more minutes. And so again, it's just from watching and reading. Yeah, it varies. But, but I think what I mean when, when I say that the beginning of a poem can kind of unfold naturally, you said Mm -hmm. almost unremarkably, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of, what is taught is that the, the hook is so important. You have to mm-hmm. really grip your reader. Yeah. But a lot of what you just said is like, this is a very like mundane first sentence. Mm-hmm. It's the facts. Right. It's nothing really, really special, but it still grips you. It still gets you interested in what's happening here, who these characters are, like what the conflict is, what's going on in the scene. Yeah. Not even, yeah, not even, but it interests you. It interests you because you're getting out of the reader's way, right? It's just the content, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, you know, if I, if the opening of this poem were something horrible, like it was two things that made me really know that trouble was about to go down or like, you know, like the longer I talk, the more I'm holding off the action of the poem from you mm-hmm. as the reader. Right. right. Um, so, so, so often the, the best thing you can do is get out of your way right? Get out of the reader's way and get to the content, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of what we call like throat clearing, setting out the scene, describing each character and their uh, family tree and what they look like, um, and then beginning the action, begin the action. Just get to the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And those things can be scenic or or whatever, but um, yeah, just like the facts should stand or the facts can be the powerful thing. The content. And then I like, and I really like the uh, way you describe, like, the ending of a strong poem. Obviously, it can vary, but, like, mm-hmm. that, that pause, that breath. I feel mm-hmm. like I was describing it before as, like, a, the ending of a good poem almost. The person reading it or the person hearing it almost has, like, a facial ex- expression change. Mm-hmm. Like, you're either smiling or you're... Mm-hmm. I think the breath is a better way of describing But there's some effect uh-huh. that's going on, like, inside of you physically. When mm-hmm. you hear like a strong ending, there's a realization, there's a click. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's what Emily Dickinson called like having the top of her head blown off, right? Like this feeling of just like tingling after a story has ended or a poem has ended. If it really works, like you don't even want to talk about it. Yeah, 
you just want to stay with that and in that in that moment with that energy um but yeah of course like you know there's there's a million different ways you can accomplish it the, the, the whatever one gets you to that that's what you want so let's try to maybe get to this stack of books that <laughs> yeah. you brought in with uh -huh. your, your book racks yeah um, what do you think what do you think would make sense to mm -hmm. i guess recommend to the audience the listeners sure well i got i got a number of things i didn't i couldn't decide so um i mean one thing that i feel like w is my my first sort of like novel that i was going to recommend which is just it's a fun book for anybody right this isn't just for for you if you think that you're going to be a writer when you grow up or something but uh obviously like uh, many of us have been keyed into the negotiations of, of the, of baseball, uh, happening down in Florida this week. And also right now that it's the first of March, realizing that we're, we might not be getting baseball as soon as we thought, hoping to get some at all. Um, this is like this book, uh, the art of fielding by Chad Harbaugh. Have you read this? No. So this is like baseball, Harry Potter. This is like, this is like an amazing, um, campus novel. It's about a college baseball team. Um, it's also about like a college English department. Um, and it's just a really fun book that follows a group of friends. Uh, it's, it's quite big and I am a really, really slow reader and I tore through this book. Um, wow. so this is just like, it's from, you know, it's from the library. <laughs> it's available locally go get it for spring break you know like and it's it's a good baseball book i love baseball um but it's it's obviously it's doing a lot beyond that and and uh looking at uh gender sexuality uh literature and like the the use of literature in in a modern you know world why study it how does it matter um and also just like the 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 really interesting things that i think athletics share with um with art making which is like getting into the zone, um, having confidence, being in the flow of something, right? Like where you're, you're successfully working without thought getting in the way. Mm -hmm. Um, so like that, that stuff comes into play too. I like um, that. but yeah, it's like, it's a, it's like a very grown up novel that feels like reading a Matt Christopher, like sports novel when I was like in fourth grade. So um, that was one that I just thought is a, is a really good recommend for anybody. So you were a baseball player growing up? I was, yeah. Yep. I played, I played growing up. I was a, a pretty good catcher um, and played really seriously year round until I was 16, at which point, you know, and then one day I was like, I don't love this. Yeah. Like th this, I was, you know, it was like a practice in December or something. And I was like, <laughs> wait, I love baseball. Why don't I love being here right now and at that point so then I like dropped out of the high school team and and started I was the coach became the coach manager of my own friends like city league team so we like started and it, I don't know if this even really exists in in Baltimore or Maryland because there are so many high schools but then there's like rec leagues where a lot of people would play in high school so then it was like me and this sort of ragtag group of like high school so much team more dropouts and it was the be one of the best experiences of my life. Yeah. Um, I was our coach, um, whereas, you know, with other parents as coaches, as, as other managers, and it was just like everything that we loved about the game. Um, yeah. Wow. I mean, Long that, digression about baseball. I, well, I think that's good advice too, is like sports have gotten so crazy in mm -hmm. that the club scene is just all year round and, it gets so like monotonous and you're playing the same sport in December and in the summer mm -hmm. and just a full calendar of one single sport. Yeah. And I think people forget that the sports are supposed to be fun. You're supposed to be with your friends, having a good time competing, operating at that, the, the zone, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like it's, it's an enjoyable experience. Yeah. And if it's all year round and you're not having fun with it, like mm -hmm. it's time to, it's time to find one of those, other leagues or mm -hmm. something else where you can. Yeah. Because I think that's what it's all about. I think so. I mean, I wasn't Adley Rutschman either, you know? Like, I yeah. wasn't I wasn't forgoing a, a Pac-12 baseball career. Like, Draft I was pick. good. I was good, but <laughs> I wasn't, like, I wasn't mortgaging my future yeah. to give myself some time to skateboard and do other stuff and still then play. Like, I mean, we were the best team. We were the best team in the league yeah. um, because it was all of these guys who were actually like quite invested in baseball, but just, you know, maybe not 12 months a year anymore. 
yeah. and it really was a blast. It's like a realization too. It's mm-hmm. like I had so many friends in high school play baseball super, super seriously, like mm-hmm. they're going to the league. And mm-hmm. how many guys actually, you know, other than mm-hmm. Peter Huback, but you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> how many guys actually get there? It's yeah. very, very few. Right. Which is no reason not to do something either, right? Yeah. Like, but but it was I I I think maybe a slightly like mature moment where I realized as a, a young kid, but like you know, all of these pressures about the the team um, were actually souring the thing for me. Um, but maybe that's a mental toughness issue too, you know? Like, uh, <laughs> maybe I I you know there are certainly moments where I feel like even with poetry, like I should be digging in really really hard and Mm -hmm. so you know knowing when to like commit or and when you're just tired of something that's a tough question but that's something that i think athletics and the arts have in common yeah for sure well i'm gonna check that one out because i've seen that cover before yeah i think fenimore has two copies so all right you know go get them (laughs) uh yeah Anything else? Ben Lerner book yeah so the other novel i was going to recommend is this book um the Topeka School by Ben Lerner, uh, which is a really great book uh, about being a high school boy. Um, the the author, and this is you know what some people call like have have called a movement in modern fiction, sort of since the 2010s as like auto fiction, right? Where uh, this is very very deliberately like the the author's life, and but it's it's a really interesting book because he's thinking back onto his teenage years in Topeka, Kansas, um, but then also writes chapters of the book from his father's voice and his mother's. And so it's a great, really interesting and sometimes scary book about like the ways that we can and can't know our parents, um, the ways that we can and can't fully know our kids. Um, but it's, it encourages empathy across those lines, right? Like it, 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 um, I hope like if you were a teen reading it, it would make you think more deeply about your parents and, and how your actions are sort of a part of their lives. And, um, but also it's a really good book about like masculinity and, and how we are, the roles or scripts that we kind of act out or are asked to act out as people with male presenting bodies in high school and in really like, you know, masculine spaces. Um, the book is, you know, the character, Adam, as a high schooler, is going through all of that. Um, so it's a good book in that way, too. Yeah, I like him a lot. I like uh, Leaving Atocha Station by him. It's awesome. It's a great it's one. so good. Yeah, so, I mean, I feel like these are that was a pretty dry description of what's also a fun book. There are also great um, sections of, like, high school debate tournaments. They're pretty, yeah. pretty gnarly in here. Um, yeah. I've had, I've, I've had this book for a while, but I've not given it a full read yet only a couple a couple chapters but. it's really interesting it's yeah. pretty intense you know and like the form is is pretty eye-opening right to just like break the novel and then have it be told by the the father in the looking back on these some of these same events the mother like a lot of her chapters are just phone calls that she's having with adam the, the main character mm-hmm. it's good all right. Well, thank you very much for the Rex. Yeah. Thanks for coming in today. Appreciate yeah. it. It was a great conversation. It was really cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Thanks, Chesare. Thank you very much, Chesare. Yeah. We'll see ya. Thank you. Thank you.